When Gregor Mendel founded the law of independent assortment, he crossed pure breeding, round and yellow peas, with pure breeding, wrinkled and green peas, giving him an F1 generation of all round and all yellow peas. Then he selfed the F1, and he got the classic 9331 ratio, which was able to allow him to formulate the law of independent assortment. Let's take a look at these diagrams which explain what independent assortment means. And this diagram illustrates the meaning of independent assortment. In Mendel's F1, the peas were heterozygous for round and yellow. And the possible gametes included these four possibilities here. Each of these having an equal chance of coming into existence following meiosis. Big R segregating with big Y into one gamete because of the random assortment of chromosomes or big R segregating with little y with an equal chance allowing for the gamete big R little y and the gamete little r big y to have an equal chance of forming as the big R, big Y, and little r, little y. Recombinants, as they're called, are the result of the random assortment of chromosomes. And this law is valid when these genes are located on separate chromosomes. But what if the gene for the texture of the coat and the color of the seed were located on the same chromosome? What if they were linked? Then we could have a completely different set of results. But Gregor Mendel was not faced with this situation. After the work of Mendel was recognized at the turn of the 20th century, researchers like Bateson and Punnett and Saunders, and of course Thomas Morgan and his graduate student Sturtevant, these researchers began to work with both plant and animal specimens to see if any discrepancies existed in the work of Gregor Mendel. For this is the nature of science. One discovery is presented, others seek to build and to verify this discovery, or perhaps to identify variations, exceptions, or discrepancies with the findings. And so it was with Mendel's law of independent assortment. Perhaps the first post-Mendelian study of this nature came in 1901 from Bateson, working with the association between the genes that cause chicken feather color or chicken plumage and the comb or the headpiece of the chicken. Later, Bateson teamed with Punnett and Saunders to work with sweet peas. And of course, the most famous work came from Thomas Morgan and his graduate student Sturtevant. Morgan observed a white-eyed fruit fly in his collection, and he crossed this white-eyed fly with red-eyed flies. The resulting F1 were all red-eyed. Then he crossed these offspring with members of the same generation, selfing the F1. This gave rise to the F2. In the F2, Morgan noticed that there was one white-eyed fly for every three red-eyed flies. But he also observed many of the white-eyed flies were males. And this is the discovery that's most widely acclaimed today as the one that led the way in our understanding of exceptions to Mendel's second law, the law of independent assortment. Morgan and Sturtevant would go on to map several chromosomes of the fruit fly Drosophila, and their work is widely acclaimed as one of the most significant advances in the science of genetics. Today, we examine the work of Bateson, Punnett, and Saunders. Let's first take a look at their experiment and examine the reasons for the non-Mendelian ratios that they got. And then we will look at their conclusions. And finally, we will apply the chi-square test to demonstrate the significant difference between their result and the expected results following a normal Mendelian pattern. with purple flowers long pollen, with sweet peas with red flowers, and round pollen. Here we can represent the pure breeding or homozygous parents used in this cross. 
Note that the gene for color of the flower is on the same chromosome as the gene for the shape of the pollen. Today we describe this as gene linkage. In conducting an investigation along the same lines as Mendel's, when these pure breeding plants were crossed, these were the gametes produced, and this was the genotype of the F1. Upon selfing the F1, these were the possible gametes, with the big P little l and the small p little l being the recombinants. Recalling that if this inheritance were following a normal Mendelian pattern, then the probability of getting these gametes would be the same as the probability of getting these. But when the genes are located on the same chromosome, then the chance of them being separated to give rise to recombinants is much less. For it depends on another occurrence, and not just upon independent assortment. In the case of these linked genes, a crossover must occur just at the right point for the little p allele to combine with the big L allele. And the probability of getting this chiasma is so small that it makes the likelihood of getting these recombinants much less than in a case where the genes are located on separate chromosomes. In Mendel's cross, he got the classic 9 3, 3, 1 ratio. And if the sweet peas followed a similar pattern, then this would be the ratio expected. 9, 3, 3, and 1. The actual result looked something like this, with the expected outcome shown here in this column, and the observed outcomes shown here. Here you can see that the genotypes which require recombination in order to exist have a very low frequency of occurrence. And the genotypes which result from no crossing over have a very high occurrence. Bateson, Punnett and Saunders realized that these results were very unlikely and not just due to some random experimental variation. They concluded that this may be due to what they termed coupling and they were among the first to identify a pattern of non-Mendelian inheritance. But we can employ the chi-square test to demonstrate how significant this outcome is, and that it is not just due to random experimental variation. To carry out the chi-squared test in this case, we first need to determine the number of degrees of freedom. And because there are four categories, then the number of degrees of freedom is 4 minus 1 equals 3. Then we find the difference between the observed values and the expected values we square those and we divide by the expected value. Then we find the sum of all categories in number 2. This would give us the value for chi-squared. And then we go to the table of critical values. Here you can see the results of the Bateson, Punnett and Saunders cross so that we can do a chi-squared test. Here chi-squared comes to 48.8. Moving to the table of critical values, and locating the degree of freedom, which is 3, and then moving along this row to find our value for chi-squared, we note that 48 would be way to the right of this 12.83, and 12.83 gives us a p-value of 0 0.005, which is a very small p-value, and well below the threshold of 0 0.05 which is required in most scientific research to demonstrate that the observed value is significantly different from the expected value. And here, our actual p-value is much smaller than 0 0.005, demonstrating that the statistical evidence 
fully supports the conclusion of Bateson, Punnett, and Saunders.